We are the Chicago Economic Society. Uh, we're a new affinity group of the university, and this is our first panel discussion. It's our second event, and I want to encourage all of the people in the audience to suggest further events. We're about encouraging the uh, advancement of our economic and political education. Political economy, social economics, the whole gamut. So please reach out to the members of our committee. Um, Julie, stand up, please. Stephen Wang, where's Stephen? He's here. Stand up, please reach out and let them know. And with that, I'm going to ask um, Michael Roberts, who is the principal organizer of this panel, to get up and introduce the panelists. Thank you for joining us. Should I use a microphone? Do you have Or for the camera? Okay. Um, well, good evening and welcome. Um, I want to thank you and our esteemed panel uh, for, for attending. Um, I also want to thank Alec Diaku uh, for hosting us at the New York Athletic Club. This is a wonderful venue. Uh, my name is Michael Roberts, and it's my honor to introduce our moderator and panelists uh, to this Macro Masters Workshop. Uh, workshops have special significance at UChicago. They play an integral procedural role in what the university is best known for, for the vigorous and relentless, and relentless pursuit of lasting truth. In fact, Milton Friedman once said, the true test of any scholar's work is not what his contemporaries say, but what happens to his work in the next 25 to 50 years. Fortunately, on Wall Street, we don't have to wait that long. <laughs> Instead, one might say, the true test of any investor's work are their long-term performance and the quality of their ideas. And based on those metrics, tonight, we're very fortunate to be joined by the very best. They have, they've been successful in perhaps the most challenging and debated area in investments, macroeconomics. They are, as the title indicates, macro masters. I'd like to introduce our moderator and the panelists. Uh, Rebecca Jarvis, our moderator, graduated from the college in 2003 and is the chief business and economics correspondent for ABC News. She's interviewed some of the biggest names in business, including former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker, Warren Buffett, Jack Dorsey of Twitter, and Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg. Prior to ABC, Rebecca was a co-anchor for CBS This Morning Saturday, a financial correspondent for CNBC, and an investment banker. Dr. Todd Petzl graduated from the college in 1973 also received his master's in 1973, and received his PhD from the University of Chicago Department of Economics in 1976. Currently, Todd is the Chief Investment Officer of Offit Capital Advisors. Prior to joining Offit, Todd was the Chief Investment Officer at the Commonwealth Fund, and was the Chief Economist at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Todd began his career as an economics professor at McAllister College and at Stanford University and was later a lecturer in finance at the University of Chicago from 1989 to 1996. Next, John Scursi received his MBA from the University of Chicago in 1981 and is the Portfolio Manager and Chief Investment Officer for Corona Associates Capital Management. John has a 40-year investment career with Morgan Stanley and Lazard and as an independent investor. In 1999, John managed a U.S. technology-focused fund uh, for the London-based Park Place Capital, which returned approximately 2,080% over one year. <laughs> Not surprisingly, that's a world record. Dennis Statman, CFA, received his MBA from the University of Chicago in 1980 and is the managing director of the global asset allocation team at BlackRock. Dennis has been the portfolio manager for, Black, for BlackRock's flagship global allocation fund since its inception. Um, Dennis uh, saw significant opportunities in the 1980s, late 1980s um, in international markets. And last time I checked, 
He had over eighty billion dollars under management. I heard tonight is closer to a hundred. So hundred. <laughs> Um, making must, which must make his fund one of the largest allocation funds in the world. Um, he's also bla on BlackRock's Portfolio Management Group Executive Committee, the Leadership Committee, and the Central Strategy Group. Uh, finally, Dan Roberts is the Chief Investment Officer and Head of Global uh, Fixed Income at Mackay Shields. He's the parent of two U Chicago grads, uh, my sister and I. Uh, <laughs> I really had to twist his arm. <laughs> Uh, Dan manages high yield and asset allocation portfolios which invest based on his macroeconomic views. This year, institutional investor named his team the best high yield manager and Lipper named them the best performing unconstrained bond funds for three and five year periods. He began his career at the White House uh, in the Reagan administration with the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Rebecca, I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I asked Michael for questions for Dr. Roberts, and I also asked on John's behalf, Julian, some questions about what we should be talking to his dad. And I promised lots of zingers tonight. No zingers. Uh, but you all are welcome to ask questions at the end, and we'll make sure to leave some time for that. But I want to start with you, Dr. Petzl. Um, you were a student at the University of Chicago in the 1970s. You were there during the Milton Friedman years, and you were a monetarist. Oh, yes. How do you, what is your framework for macro investing today? Well, lots happened in 40 plus years since I left the college. Uh, I will tell you, a lot of you went through the college as economics majors. Michael's heard this story. When I was there in my entering class, there were 500 students in the whole college for my year, and there were nine economics majors. It was that popular. Uh, <laughs> It was a hard major, and it was a very politically unpopular major at the time. But it was, I feel blessed and lucky that I, I was enough of an iconoclast to go through and, and, and be with the not so cool kids. Um, at that time, 90%, 85% of the economists in the country were multiplier Keynesians, is what I call them. Spend, let the government spend a dollar, you could somehow miraculously get four or five dollars of GDP out of it. And Chicago was the beacon, it was like a radio station in the middle of the country, sending out messages saying, that's not quite right, that doesn't quite work that way. And we were just at the start of inflation after the Vietnam War. We went through the first oil crisis in 74, big inflation. And the big deal at the time, of course, was that we had lots of empirical uh, reinforcement for the fact that money made a difference. And we felt like we were, we had a chip on our shoulder, we felt really good about our message, and you come out of the 70s with the Chicago experience and the economy and the markets that we had in the 70s, and you feel pretty comfortable about this, this the state of the world. Now the problem with that, the next 30 years, because there was this little variable called velocity in MV equals PT, we always blew it off. Money was important, prices were important, transactions were important, velocity kind of stayed, it was okay. You didn't pay much attention to it, nobody could really explain it. And of course, that's exactly what we all got wrong over the last five to eight years. Velocity is the driver of what's going on in the macro economy. So yes, I still think of myself as a monetarist, but now I think of myself more as a radical pragmatist. Uh, because we have to get our ideas on, on how these things come together. I'm still not a multiplying Keynesian, uh, but uh, that's how you get there. And how you apply this to the real world, if you think about, I'm, I'm anxious to hear my colleagues here as well, but I think if, if you look at the biggest mistakes that have been made in the last five years coming out of the crisis, it was the fact that all investors of, of note said, we cannot absorb all of this debt. We cannot bring all of this system together at these interest rates. We have to have rising interest rates. Year after year after year, again in 2014, up and down the street, you said, what's the 10 year going to be? It's going to be someplace between three and a quarter and four and a quarter, and we're sitting at 265, you know, a third of the way through the year. How do we keep getting that mistake uh, in, our, in our system? Uh, I think that's a, a you know, one of the challenges that macro doesn't give us all the easy answers. It's still a very, very tough science. John, I want to talk to you because you align yourself with the Austrian School of Thought. 
and I'm curious to know how that shapes your macro framework. Um, I guess, I guess my um, view on on the um, Austrian school is essentially that I'm intrigued by it because it's not the school that is really embraced by Wall Street, and I think that you have to like look at everything critically and examine when everyone accepts a certain point of view, what could be the possible holes in that point of view. And one of the things that really struck me when I began to read this um, point of view is that um, people in general are not looking at a dollar or at our currency as the fluid instrument that it is. In other words, we tend to look at it as some kind of a static you know, element, when in fact, it's, I, I kind of think of it as an ice cube that's melting on the sidewalk. And when I started to, to actually, out of curiosity, study what money was, and, and it was interesting to hear you know, Todd's pr perspective uh, from the, the Chicago point of view, what I find is that you know, when, when people work on Wall Street, um, they never ask themselves, what is money? And what is it supposed to be? What is it supposed to do? What are its attributes? And how does it actually perform its role as money? And we kind of think of our money as a given um, thing that is uh, in, a, in a form that doesn't change, when in reality, um, it is changing. and. Um, our concept of money has evolved and, and may be, in fact, something that is truly flawed. And, and I actually believe that the financial crisis that we're in is one which is a crisis of our money due to the fact that it is a conceptual type of money which is not redeemable into anything. And it didn't start out that way. So. The Austrian school is important in the sense that it gives you a, a, an historic perspective on money and how it has evolved from what it started out in being. And um, that's the part that really intrigues me because when everybody thinks of something a certain way, what if it's not that way? What if it's actually different? And the implications of a flawed concept of money is huge when you apply it in the investment world. For example, you know we're in an environment now where interest rates are at or near zero, and so how do you price an asset? What, what is the actual true value if interest rates are at zero, not by um, a market force, but by design, by a government that is manipulating it or intervening to make that um, interest rate zero. So, um, you know, the Austrian school, I think, is important because it offers you that perspective that I don't think is um, the standard point of view that most people um, accept as a given. Dennis, you were one of the first investors to really look at the international sphere to say this isn't just about U.S. stocks and bonds. How is that shaping your framework today? It truly is a, a very different world from when we started global allocation 25 years ago. And uh, just a, a, a couple of, of contrasts. Uh, first, when I went to work uh, back then, I took my own computer to the office because we didn't have them. Uh, if we wanted information on a company, uh, we wrote a letter and mailed it off to the company. If we wanted it really fast, maybe we'd call their 800 number, and we'd kind of beg them to FedEx it to us. Today, uh, a middle school student with the internet in 10 minutes can come up with more information on a company than we could in days of work. So th there has been a tremendous explosion uh, and diffusion in information. Uh, the second thing uh, is that when we started global allocation, the world was still very much a regional world. Uh, 
there were very few global investors, and the global investors that there were really looked at the world regionally. Uh, they looked at Japan, or Europe, or the US, or Latin America. They didn't look at an industry and say, okay, what are the global players in this industry? Uh, today, it's a much more uh, sectorally oriented uh, base of analysis that goes on. Uh, the world of 1989 was one really of the ending of the Soviet Union and a, a collapse of the kind of bipolar uh, power structure that we had uh, at the end, uh, well, that we had from World War II to 1989. And uh, that change uh, unleashed uh, a period where uh, we got uh, a, a completely different dynamic in the power uh, in the world. We, we used to be thinking about military power, and we didn't think a lot about economic power. Uh, America was uh, really an unrivaled superpower economically. And we kind of lost track of the unique status that that gave us. And being that single superpower allowed us some privileges. Uh, and uh, just to name a couple, uh, John spoke about money. Uh, we got to define money for the world. And we pulled a, a few flim flam acts in the process. Uh, one of them was in 1971, we detached money uh, from uh, its direct link to gold. And subsequently, I think it was in the 1980s, uh, we detached it from its statutory limitation uh, with respect uh, to the monetary base. What we did in the process was we allowed our country to become the dominant consumer in the world, first by drawing down our checking account balance, so to speak, and second, by running up our debt. In, if you take a look at the Federal Reserve's behavior, uh, beginning in the mid-90s, the Fed became much more aggressive in creating money, and that money spilled out of the United States all around the world. Then when uh, China became part of the WTO, and effectively labor became a global commodity, that made all the difference in the world to <coughs> two things. First, the purchasing power of the dollar and consumer goods was no longer limited to the cost base of America. Uh, so the worker in New Jersey lost his job to the worker in Mexico who lost his job to the worker in China. The good part of that was if you had a job in America, consumer goods were very, very cheap. And those consumer goods were paid for by an ever-increasing amount of borrowing. Uh, the bad news was if you were uh, a, an auto worker in America, uh, there was no other alternative. When you lost your UAW job at GM, the next job wasn't down a dollar an hour, it was at 25 cents on the dollar of what you earned before. And America has been coping with that change ever since. And as a result, on the one hand, we built a lot of debt in a consumer society. On the other hand, our production capacity uh, got hollowed out. And so when economists talk, a, a lot of times we talk in financial terms. One of the most helpful things that any economist ever said to me was, for a moment, just forget about the financial terms and look at the real terms. Well, what happened in the real terms was as those Chinese workers uh, got jobs off the farm and in the factory, America's 
current account deficit financed an explosion in production capacity in China. And I don't know if you noticed on the front page of the FT last week, uh, in purchasing power parity terms, it now looks as though the Chinese economy will surpass in size the U.S. economy this year. And if you look at hard measures like cement production or steel production or copper consumption, the Chinese economy is vast compared to ours. And so in a world where America used to be the dominant economic producer, we no longer are. We are still the dominant financial economy because we've convinced the, do the world to take dollars. But those dollars ultimately have value because of our ability to produce. And those dollars have been building factories in China, not in Akron, Ohio. That's the big, big change. Dr. Roberts, I want to talk to you as well because you're another monetarist in the room. And I'd like to hear from you your framework. It's, it's, it's more, yes it is, it's monetarist. It starts, I guess the best way to say it is, um, it, when you're a kid, if you like to put together puzzles, and you had a big puzzle, and you had lots and lots of pieces, and you spread it out all over the floor, and you, when you put together a puzzle, where do you start? You start at the edges, and you start with a frame. And from our perspective, that's where we start. We, we think that the frame of the puzzle is central bank activity. So, so central bank activity is, is really, it gives us the, the shape of what we think the, the economy will start to look like. And who is the dominant player, player in, the, in, 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 in the central banking community? Well, it's, it's the Fed. So the, the Fed has a, has a very, very dominant, a very dominant role. So, and when you put together a frame of a puzzle, you see whether the puzzle is round or whether it looks square or triangular, or it looks like a snake. And, but then, then you start to put together the other pieces. And some of the other pieces, maybe you can see the, the face of a tiger or the tail of a dog or whatever. And you, those, are, those are sort of the, the, the different economies around the world. And then you start putting the pieces together. And, and that's what we try to do. If you, think, if you think of all those different pieces as, as economic numbers, what we try to do is piece those economic numbers together into a puzzle and put them within the, the, the monetary framework. Now, we, we are monetarists, but we're, we're, I guess we're a little bit, we're not so strict. Uh, we're more eclectic in, in, one, in one way in that we, we think government activity uh, will cause real problems with, with, with the economy um, and will cause some of the things that, that Keynes talked about. So for example, in 2008, we thought that we were very much caught in a Keynesian liquidity trap. And very much like what um, what Japan was um, in the uh, in the late in the late 80s, and that is no matter how low the Fed could lower interest rates or did lower interest rates, if they, they got to zero, they really couldn't lower rates too much more. So what the Fed had to do, and, and what they did do, is uh, because this is all because they had screwed up prior prior to this, by the way, but but. What they did do is, is, they, is, is they, they first tried the kind of thing that Japan tried to, to get out of their problems. And what did Japan try? Well, J Japan tried very traditional monetary activity. And that is that Japan went into the market, bought JGBs, gave yen to the banks, and the banks in the late 80s in Japan said, I, I, I don't have either the capital uh, or the willingness to lend. So the money went to the banks and right back to Bank of Japan. Never got into the system. Now, part of that is because they didn't, they didn't have a, a deep and, and liquid secondary market like what we have in the US. But it never got to the people that needed it. Now, so when, this, when that happened, uh, Bernanke said, well, uh, Bernanke wrote a paper in 2002, and, and what he said is he, he suggested what he would do if the US was faced with a very similar kind of situation. And what he did was he said, well, I'm going to first try to do the same thing. I'm going to try to put money into the system. I'm going to buy, buy treasuries. But the same thing happened. The money just kept coming right back to the, to the Fed. 
So nothing happened. And the banks really didn't want to lend, just like the banks in Japan. So what did Bernanke do? He became the biggest banker, commercial banker in the world. And that hadn't happened till mm -hmm. since 1936. The Fed went in and they started to buy paper in the marketplace, and they unfroze the markets. So there are situations in that, that are, when, when the government gets involved, the government creates, uh, creates problems, and in some senses, the, uh, the Feds, the Fed in this case, and the Treasury got involved to try to, to unstick the economy. And when the Fed did do that and became the, the biggest commercial banker in the world, they started pumping money into the economy, and, and by doing that, they started buying paper, and the markets did unfreeze. So, uh, in my sense, in, in, in my world, we were very, very close to the edge of the cliff at that point. And the Fed and the Treasury were probably the only two people who had the capability of pulling us back. Uh, and, and, and they did. They pulled us back from, that's to say they pulled us back from a situation that they had created years before. But uh, they still pulled us back from, 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 from the edge. So in, in, my, in our framework, it, it's not a strict monetarist framework because whenever you look at a framework, you make assumptions. And sometimes those assumptions in real life just don't pan out. So you have to take a more eclectic look at the world and decide what your framework should look like given the, the assumptions that are violated in some of those models. And that's what we do. So what assumptions are you making about Yellen's Fed right now, and what does that mean for your opportunities that you see in the real marketplace? Um, Yellen, Yellen is more dovish than probably uh, than probably Bernanke was, so she'll probably keep things on on uh, hold um, a little longer than Bernanke. She, in other words, she'll make the problem worse. So, which means that at some point, uh, our biggest concern is is not that the U.S. economy is going to fall. <coughs> Our biggest concern is that the U.S. economy is going to heat up, and inflation will come back into the system, which we see as almost inevitable. And when that happens, what will happen is that wages will start to pick up, and this huge monetary base, think of it like a huge stack of wood that the, the Fed just keeps get, building bigger and bigger and bigger, and all it needs is an inflationary spark to get it going. And we could we could have um, one tremendous bonfire uh, that's 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 raging, and um, the Fed in that in that situation, well, things will won't be pretty in that, in that situation. I remember Boker said to me, the most difficult thing to do is to take the punch bowl away just as the party is getting started. How many of you uh, believe that under this Fed things will get worse? I definitely believe. They will fluctuate. <laughs> so what does that mean, Dennis? If they will fluctuate, and you are looking at, 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 I thought it was interesting because you, you mentioned the fact that it is a different world. You're looking at sectors. Um, you mentioned the purchasing power of China. What does that mean for where the opportunities exist, in your view? So I think the Fed has made a decent sized mistake, a huge mistake. The decent sized mistake was financing the tech bubble. The huge mistake was financing uh, the house finance bubble. We had more of a bubble in mortgage securities than we had in the housing market. There was real, real craziness in mortgage securities. And I think the Fed is making a third mistake in not allowing in 2008, 9, and 10 the markets to clear by price, but rather they uh, cause the markets to clear by excess liquidity. And uh, 
So I agree with the view that the Fed has piled up a, a huge amount of fuel for potential inflation. Uh, and at some point, uh, I, I think we are vulnerable to a shock. What kind of shock? Well, you know, I ask myself this question every day because we want to get out ahead of it. Uh, you mentioned something that I think is our nascent worry, and I don't think there are many people worried about it right now, but labor costs. So much of our economic equilibrium right now sits on labor being perceived as, uh, in the U.S., as cheap <coughs> and abundant. And it's not clear to me that it is. I think it's a bifurcated labor market uh, where uh, the labor in this room is not cheap and abundant. Uh, it's scarce and high value, and its price is going up. Uh, the 55-year-old guy who works with his hands and maybe had a union job uh, 10 or 15 years ago, he's in surplus, and no monetary policy is going to fix that. But the attempt to fix overall unemployment with monetary policy may have sown the seeds for labor costs getting out of hand. And if they do, it's going to hit us on interest rates, and it's going to hit us on corporate profits. And that would be a very, very bad combination for the stock market. Dr. Petzl, I saw you shaking your head at some points in agreement. Well, I, I was puzzled by your question. Will the Fed make it worse? And, and my question was, for whom? If I'm a borrower of high credit rating, it couldn't be much better than it is right now, and has been for the last handful of years. And if I'm if I'm somebody who's a saver, if I'm my, my I'm my 89 year old father who has modest wealth, rolls over CDs and, and asks me all the time, when am I going to get a reasonable rate of interest again? And I I, I resist the temptation to tell him probably not in your lifetime. <laughs> uh, it's it's a very different question. Mm -hmm. So, John touched upon. I think the key to the puzzle, which is the zero interest rate policy, um, which I think people who write columns for the New York Times would say is absolutely essential to get the, the machinery of the economy moving, I would argue quite the contrary. You've got tens of millions of savers, not wealthy people, but just true savers who would like to not eat into their capital. And their consumption is badly constrained and has been badly constrained by literally hundreds of billions of dollars a year by the interest that they're not receiving. So I actually think the zero interest rate policy has been a, has been a restraint on growth, not a help. Uh, if the Fed gets out of QE and gets interest rates back up to real positive rates of interest, it could actually be a spur to the economy and then could lead to the problems that, that all the other guys are mentioning. The other thing I will say is that people debate all the time, is the Fed's primary mission to control inflation or is it to support the economy? And that's, that's an interesting discussion. I would choose the answer none of the above. The Fed's primary mission is to support the banking system. And if you don't believe that, then ask yourself the question, why are they paying banks 25 basis points to keep over $2 trillion of excess reserves on the balance sheet of the Fed? That's a $5 billion subsidy that's going to the large money center banks year in, year out. Might have been essential and helpful in the early parts of, this, of the crisis, but now that balance sheets of banks are, are much better shape, I think it's, a, it's an extravagance uh, and it's painful to the, to the rest of the uh, economy who's, uh, who's going forward. So your question is, is it going to get worse? Uh, I think Mrs. Yellen is going to keep, if she's going to make a mistake, her mistake is going to be to keep interest rates too low for too long, not raise them. They've all read Friedman and Schwartz's Great Contraction. They've all read Bernanke's dissertation. You don't want to, if you're a central banker, you don't want to pinch your recovery in its early stages. Uh, so I think they're going to, I think we're going to be living with really low interest rates for a long time, and I think that's going to be a problem. John? There are two parts to the um, problems uh, or you know, what could go wrong with the Fed, et cetera. Um, the other part of it is what mistake do investors make? Because they are actually going along. You know, if the Fed is the puppet master, the rest of us are going along with their um, little script on what we should be doing or how we should be viewing the world. And, um, 
one of the biggest mistakes I think that we as investors can make is very simply to continue to have confidence in the Fed as having our backs covered in the, in the sense that this, the, the idea of a Fed put, if anything were to go wrong, the Fed has your back. Um, you know, one of the things that, I, and, and I think Todd touched upon this, you know, the, the, um, this link of, that no one seems to be able to quantify or um, identify how it's calibrated, the velocity that he mentioned, um, there is one thing that the Fed is powerless to do, and that is their power is derived from being able to print an unlimited amount of money and to use it to buy anything they want. And the idea is you can support or levitate any market, any price when you have that power, except for one thing, and that is the dollar. You cannot print dollars to support a falling dollar. And if the dollar starts to fall, the Fed is powerless. And everything that we adopt as a um, premise, you know, when we go in to invest, would be completely undermined in that situation. And that's when Todd's thing comes into play. But it could come into, a play, into play in a way that no one could even imagine, potentially, because it's not part of our living memory. But as humans, we could be induced to act on that fear, which would unleash a velocity that no one has any comprehension because we've never seen it before. But um, the other thing that I would mention is that, uh, you know, in terms of what Dan's comment is about in the inflation, all the money that we need to create a hyperinflation has already been created. It's already out there. It just needs, you know, people to act on it. And one of the things that gives the dollar value is the fact that people are willing to hold the dollar. And for years, if not, you know, for uh, several lifetimes, the U.S. has gotten, as Dennis was mentioning, a free ride because people, savers around the world, were willing to hold the dollar. The dollar was their surplus that they earned from producing whatever they were producing that we were consuming. Well, they were content to just sit on those dollars. So those imbalances just kept building and building and building in the form of this ever higher stack of dollars. Well, that's not a problem as long as they keep holding the dollars. But the Fed has no power to induce them to hold the dollar. In fact, the only power that they have to induce people to hold the dollar is the very thing that would destroy the United States and the Fed, which is to raise interest rates to such a high level that it would expose the insolvency of the United States. So um, I think the biggest mistake is actually being made by investors, not by the Fed. The Fed has actually succeeded in almost doing the impossible. I mean, when you think about it, what they've done is they've created an ocean of money and made us all think that as they've been creating it, it's still worth the same thing that it was when they began to create it, which is almost, you know, um, I mean, you have to give them credit for having done that. They've been masterful at that. And I think all of their spoken statements and all of their, you know, orchestrations um, have been very successful in that. And yet, one of the difficulties for investors who think exactly like you think, who have fought the Fed, so to speak, they have lost. Mm -hmm. If they took that theme and they applied it to their investments, they have lost money, at mm -hmm. least in the near term. And when that judgment day, or if that judgment day comes, it's very important as an investor to be able to stay through this infinite potentially infinite land of unknown where it hasn't actually come to pass. So how do you, when you think that way, how do you invest so that you honor your thesis, but you also in the near term for your investors continue to make money? Well, I think that's the, uh, you know, $60 trillion question. And, and uh, 
I'm glad I asked it. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think, you know, someone could justifiably say, well, well, you know, it's been that way for so long. Why couldn't it be that way for another several so longs, another, you know, 50 or 60 years? But I think things have genuinely changed. As an investor, you have to be cognizant of timing uh, because money and time are obviously linked and so on. But I think what's changed is that the dollar has lost its structural support. And where did that support come from? Well, it came from the fact originally that these pr super producers, the, the Chinas of the world, the Europe's of the world at one point, uh, Japan at one point, were willing to hold dollars. And they were accumulating um, greater, def greater uh, surpluses that they had to recycle back to the United States in this virtuous cycle. Well, what's changed is that those surpluses have gone away. And they are not buying this debt that the United States is structurally emitting. You know, the United States has a structural budget deficit, and that has to be financed. Well, these other countries aren't buying it because they don't have those surpluses. And I believe that is the true purpose of QE from the beginning. It was to replace the bids in the bond market that disappeared when the surpluses of producing countries disappeared. And so that's a, a very important thing. The other thing that I think has changed, um, which is also coming back to the issue of timing, is that um, the, um, the dollar and the United States is becoming increasingly isolated. Um, and, and by that I mean, for example, about a week or so ago, uh, as, a, as a byproduct of the conflict we are having with the Ukraine, um, Russia announced that they would begin pricing their energy products in rubles. Well, did anyone stop to think what that would do to the dollar? I mean, did anybody in Washington start to think about what that could do to the dollar? Because the volume of those energy transactions is $1 trillion per annum. That's $1 trillion somebody doesn't need anymore. What they need are the rubles, because that's how they're going to pay their energy bill. It also means that the savers around the world and the, the investors around the world will be perfectly content to hold rubles, because they always know they can use it to pay for their energy bill. So. I think that's a very important change, and um, we don't know how all this will play out, but if it starts to create a situation where the dollar starts to fall in value, the Fed is truly powerless to contain that. And um, you know, I, I think that as far as the investment strategy goes, the other thing that you, you, know, you have to look at are what are the what are the um, other investment strategies that would benefit from that falling dollar, and what kind of risk parameter do they hold? And um, I think you know one of the things that Wall Street, with this concept of money that it has, it also has a very rudimentary understanding of things like gold, because it's not been part of our money for so long. So people don't understand that you know, gold, for example, has no risk. It has no credit risk. It has no counterparty risk. It has no debasement risk. So you've got this asset out there, which is basically the kryptonite to the dollar world that is actually or potentially mispriced if you had something go wrong. And, you know, it's, it, you're in an odd situation where just at a time when you might need insurance, the insurance that you need may be sitting out there for free. But there's not enough of it to go around for everybody. What's the most valuable brand in the world? If you could own a brand and you get your choice, what brand would you like to control? I think America. there's just... Mm -hmm. America. I think there's no question, it's the dollar. Okay. And so what's the nature of a brand? 
Well, a brand is something that causes us to have confidence that we know what we're buying. You know, you may or may not love McDonald's, but you're pretty sure if you go into McDonald's and get French fries, um, they're going to be hot, they're going to be salty, they're going to taste pretty good, uh, even if they're not good for you. <laughs> well, the dollar is a brand that people believe in, and it has value for only one reason, and that is because people believe in it. It is backed by nothing. What is it? A dollar today, get out a dollar, look at it, it says on the Federal Reserve note. Okay. It is a promise to pay. It is a credit instrument. And what does it promise to pay? Another Federal Reserve note. Literally. It's some sort of strange circular thing. It used to be worth uh, 0.9675 ounces of gold. And its value was very, very stable from 1793 to 1933. Um, and from 1933, when it was severed from gold, till today, the dollar has lost approximately 98% of its purchasing power measured in gold. Because it's not linked to anything, and therefore politicians or central bankers can create ever larger amounts of it unregulated by anything other than our collective willingness to hold these things. And one other detail, your absolute legal requirement to use it to pay your income taxes. Anybody know what year the Federal Reserve uh, Act was passed? 1913. 1913. Anybody know what year the constitutional amendment to allow the income tax was passed? 1911. I think it was 1913 also. Um, the two are linked in a way, but other than that, it is our common belief and confidence and willingness to hold the thing. And if and when that goes away, those things are just very abundant pieces of data. Now, one might take issue with something John said. Uh, John said that the Fed is powerless to stop the depreciation of the dollar. And he may or may not be right. Let's suppose he's wrong. What could the Fed do to stop a depreciating dollar? There, there's one simple answer. Raise interest rates. So why can't the Fed do that? Well, maybe they can, but there would be a cost, right? What happens to our economy if interest rates go up and up and up? Recession. Yeah. And what would a recession do to the debt that's outstanding in America? Multiply hmm? Actually, I think it would extinguish it the hard way. Even with the interest on the debt? Uh, I, I think a recession today, a major recession, would cause defaults. So last time around we had a recession. The Fed created, uh, well, the Fed took its balance sheet from $900 billion to where it is today, $4.2 in order to avoid defaults. It chose to print. So John may or may not be right. If he's right, it's because the pain of higher interest rates would be intolerable to the political economy of America. And the way I think it would be intolerable is A, a wave of default, and B, the promises that we have outstanding to each other as a society through our government. If you take a look at the Congressional Budget Office projections for the federal deficit, uh, the combination of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest is inexorably growing and will come to dominate the political economy of the U.S. on its current trajectory. I predict it will not maintain its current trajectory. 
we will default on Medicare. We will probably default on Medicaid. We won't quite default on Social Security, but it will be a soft default. We won't say, oh, no more, gone. The rules will change and the benefits will shrink. Why? Because they have to. We are unwilling to tax ourselves enough to pay for these promises. There is a demographic tidal wave hitting the beach today with growth in these served populations. There is no demographic tidal wave of taxpayers to pay for it. So there will be a series of soft defaults to cut back these benefits. So what you may ask, that's the interesting thing. Dennis, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to open it up to questions okay. from the audience. But I want to leave them with this cliffhanger because you will answer the so what at the very end, OK? okay. Questions? Yes. Well, I, there are a lot of bleak, um, I don't know, prognostications, but assessments that have been made with regard to how things work today. I'm curious as to the people who are not confident about how the dollar is pegged right now, not confident about the actions of the Fed to date in recent history. What, what alternatives are you proposing? What action do you think, if any, should be taken by anyone to solidify and strengthen the U.S. economy, the currency, whatever you think is important? What do you think should be being done that is not being done today? I'll take a stab at that. I mean, I, I do think that um, there is going to be some pain that we are going to have to endure. However, it doesn't have to be apocalyptic because there is another way to deal with this problem, which history has uh, shown us has been used sparingly in the past. And that's very simple. Just devalue the dollar dramatically. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. One of them is to just print a lot of it. Um, and you're going to devalue it that way. You can also keep doing what we're doing now, which is competitive devaluation, doing you know one currency at a time, but that doesn't seem to get you very far, which the last you know four or five years has shown. But there is another way that no one talks about, which is the purpose of why gold sits on the balance sheet of every major central bank, and that is you can simply, with the stroke of a pen, revalue that gold overnight. And by doing that, you are supercharging the asset side of your balance sheet. So for example, if you're carrying that gold as an asset at price X, which is the price you see every day, what if tomorrow morning somebody like the ECB or the BIS just says, well, we're prepared to bid $50,000 an ounce for every ounce of physical gold you want to sell to us. That's just like a company A announcing a tender offer for a com company B. It doesn't matter what that stock traded for the night before. When that stock opens in the morning, it'll be priced at whatever that bid is or some variation of that. By elevating the price of gold, what you're effectively doing is devaluing the currency against gold and nothing else. So it's the more intelligent way to take care of the problem because revaluing gold doesn't interfere with anything else because gold isn't used for anything else except as a store of value. Nobody eats it, nobody uses it to heat their homes up. Um, it's only used as a store of value and it can be revalued. It's been revalued in the past. So that would be an expedient way, but there, it comes at a price. That price is the winners are the people that own the gold before the revaluation. And the problem with certain countries is that they don't have enough gold to benefit from that. So that's why there's all this secret movement of gold. I say secret because nobody ever shows you where the gold is going. Even the Fed, does, or the U.S. government, because the Fed... Interestingly enough, the, the, the only central bank that doesn't, major central bank that doesn't have any gold is the United States Federal Reserve. They have a gold certificate, which is capped at $42 an ounce. That's all they ever get from that. 
uh, the, the actual gold of the United States is owned by the Treasury, and they would, of course, benefit, which maybe doesn't matter from the Fed's point of view. Mm -hmm. But the point is, why is that, first of all, why, what is it doing mm -hmm. sitting on the balance sheet? So, so is your, your, when you say problem and objective, your objective is to devalue the U.S. dollar? Well, no. The, 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 the problem with the United States, the cost to the United States would be that the United States why would. why would the United States do it? Why would they do it? As a way of taking care of the debt problem. Because for one thing, I mean, the debt problem doesn't go away until it goes away. And it's like Dennis said, you either default on it, uh, either a hard <coughs> default or a soft default. And that carries consequences. If you, did it, if you did it by revaluing gold, then all of a sudden, let's say you have an asset that's sitting on your balance sheet at $300 billion, and you revalue it, and then it's $300 trillion. Well, then you just take a little salami slice off of that, sell it in the marketplace, get rid of your debt, and reabsorb all this currency that you've been emitting. So in effect, like a bankrupt company, yeah. kind of downgrade your debt, uh, decrease the value of your debt, buy it back at a discount, or get rid of it at a discount, and move on with life. Something like that. I mean, that would be an That's intelligent true. way of doing it. So in, in 2013, we saw equity prices explode. Uh, going up immensely, and the bond bull market that has gone on for the last 30 years has sort of shirked. At the same time, uh, over the uh, year to date, bond prices have been skyrocketing and yields have been going down. I, I think uh, Dr. Todd mentioned that they're now, instead of 3.25 to 4.25, they're now at 2.6%. As investors are starting to flight towards safer yield instruments, what would you say is the largest opportunity in the market right now when it comes to the vast basket of assets that are at the investor's disposal? I'll take a, I'll take a shot at that. But I'm going to go back to currency for 30 seconds because sure. everybody talks about devaluing the dollar or revaluing. The reality is everybody in Europe wants the euro cheaper. Everybody in Japan wants the yen cheaper. Everybody in the United States wants the dollar cheaper. And they're all fiat currencies. So we're, we're kind of holding hands as a global community, raising the, the global stock of money. The Chinese want their currency now to be a little softer as well. So where does it go if you're a monetarist? NV equals PT. And we look at P and we see, ah, there's no inflation. There's something broken. But I think what's broken is our definition of inflation, because we keep looking at CPI or personal consumption expenditures. Stock market was up 30% last year in the United States. It was up 16% the year before. Assets have been inflating in many parts of the world. Ask people who, who thought the condo market in Miami would never come back. I mean, money goes someplace. It just doesn't go, like in a swimming pool, rising equally across all assets and all goods and services. So the answer to your question, I think, is how have macro economists been, macro managers been surprised over the last handful of years? They've been betting against bonds, and they have been kind of betting against stocks because every time they look up, they're more expensive. I actually think we could get a lot more asset price inflation as people are saying no, 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 and the money keeps flowing in the direction of those commodities. So which assets? Stocks. I think you have to, you know, people people have been cutting back on their exposure of stocks. I actually think that's a very dangerous sort of proposition. Thankfully, we had that proposition at our shop three, four years ago, that people should be more invested in stocks, and we've kind of held on to that view. So I am talking my book, not like anybody else on this street ever talks <laughs> my book. Uh, but that's, that's what I think is the answer, is you are going to have asset price inflation well before you get generic inflation. And then once you get generic inflation, all the things we've been talking about, you know, come into play. It's Katie bar the door at that point because it's going to be tough to get that genie back in the bottle. Go ahead. Uh, question to Dennis Hoffman. Follow up on your title wave about the demographics here. The fertility rate is maybe two children per household in the United States. Do you think in the political economy, the Republicans are pushing for the legalization of the, I mean, illegal immigrants. 
about 11 million, maybe 3 to 4 percent of the population, and opening up also the high skilled, educated foreign workers to the United States. What percentage do you think that would bring to income, uh, income tax, FICA tax, FICA tax to avoid, like you said, the hard Medicare, Medicaid default and soft default in retirement? Um, that's, my question. that's actually a very interesting question, and I'm going to restate the question. Uh, I won't answer, of course. <laughs> um, the question is, okay, uh, I've, I've laid out a, a scenario in which the U.S. defaults on its social obligations, and I'm pretty well convinced that's going to happen through a series of soft defaults, okay, so your copay for Medicare goes up, or there's a means test on uh, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera. It'll be a whole bunch of rules changes. Uh, so what can happen to prevent this? Uh, the very best and most likely thing that can happen in America is a population answer. Uh, if anybody who's uh, work, anybody here who's worked on a pension fund and done any simulations, I promise you the very most important thing for the health of your pension fund is a growing workforce. It cures all ills. Well, in America, we have something no other major industrial democracy has good organic growth in our population. So that's a big asset. Second big asset that we have is people want to come to America. Uh, we really are a beacon that attracts immigration of many of the best and the brightest. Uh, I disagree a little bit on the Republican approach to this because I think it depends on what Republican you're talking to. Uh, the smart ones that agree with me uh, <laughs> would open up uh, immigration. Uh, there are others that are somewhat reactionary and uh, pander to uh, a, a group of the population that's not quite so open-minded. Uh, but this, this is our best hope for fixing the real side of the economy. The other thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find a way for our population to come to grips with the fact that it has, plan it has lived its life counting on some promises, many of which are going to be broken or shrunken. And that's going to be a divisive social problem. We've got to learn how to come to grips with it. I wish Barack Obama had used his communications ability to start that dialogue more effectively, somebody else is going to have to do it. Two questions. Um, the first one is to John. Um, I really liked your image of uh, quantitative easing as being a replacement for no bid side from countries without surpluses. My question is uh, to you is now that quantitative easing is no longer easy, um, doesn't that more or less guarantee that interest rates will go up? And then my second question is to Dennis, if mortgage interest rates go up, say if they double, will all of the assets that BlackRock has purchased for like single family assets in distressed sand states be worth less than you bought it for? I'll be easy. Uh, I'll answer that one. Yeah, it'll be worth less. <laughs> um, I personally think that uh, QE will come back because it has to. Um, I, don't, I don't think that without this, these training wheels on the um, markets and on the economy, that the economy can stand up on its own two feet. And, um, we're go and the markets, I don't think, can tolerate um, an environment without massive new, you know, uh, purchases and money being thrown in every day. Um, I, I also wonder if, in fact, it actually has ended because there's been some very strange things that have showed up as far as who owns treasury bonds in the last few months. The little country of Belgium all of a sudden showed up as the fourth largest holder of U.S. treasuries from almost nothing uh, around the time they announced QE had ended. 
and you know could there be a straw buyer I mean the problem I have with all these things is that you know it, why not just show everybody what you're doing I mean why not just tell everybody why do we need this why don't we have a free market why don't why don't we have um, you know honest pricing of assets etc and uh, and I think the answer is you can't have them because the markets would come apart and and that exposes the real um, weakness that we have the real the real risks and the real dangers that are out there which I think um, we as investors aren't fully appreciating Dr. Roberts, you want to take it, begin? Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm somewhat more optimistic than, uh, than perhaps um, the, the, uh, a number of the other people on the panel. Um, in that, uh, I, I think, I think we, we have a shot at, at uh, coming more back, uh, back to more of an equilibrium state. Um, it's going to be tough, but it, and I think I think the shot is that we we get more moderate growth. That moderate growth continues, and that um, we we start to uh, pay off some of the debts that that, that we've accumulated. Now, um, uh, it's it, it's going to be it's going to be difficult for that. I think for that. Um, for that scenario to, to occur, but I think you know, I think we have a, a reasonable shot at doing it. Anyone else want to shout a number out? No. There's a there's a cardinal rule for business economists. You can you can have a sentence with a number in it. You can have a sentence with a date in it. You may not, and Janet Janet Yellen has just learned this. But you yeah. may not have a sentence with both a number and a date. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much to all of you. And thank you so much to all of you.